Good afternoon. I'm Ryan McMakin, and I'll be speaking on intervention. Uh, they brought me in as the, the political scientist. Uh, much of my graduate work was in political science. So uh, uh, in intervention, we'll be looking at really the relationship between the state and you, the state and market forces, how individuals act on the state and how the state works on individuals. So it's, it's different than what we've been talking about so far. We're leaving behind some of these topics where uh, we're talking strictly about market transactions, that is where it's just two people peacefully interacting, uh, deciding to trade things with each other, and moving into a realm where uh, the state is interfering in those transactions and essentially coercing the people involved in those market transactions. And so uh, Franz Oppenheimer and his book on the state had really uh, identified two different types of action. We have violent action, coercive action, and then we have voluntary action, that is action in the marketplace. And uh, so we have to uh, really take a good look and try to understand then what are the different types of state actions? Uh, what are the effects that these state actions have on the marketplace? Uh, and uh, what are the long-term and short-term effects that we, we can expect from them? And so there are two resources we'll be using in this. Uh, in your syllabus, it is listed Mises' work, uh, Middle of the Road Policy Leads to Socialism. But also of, uh, very, very useful in this is the final section of Man, Economy, and State, which I would recommend uh, you use as well. And that's the last 150 pages or so of that book. It's a section titled Violent uh, Intervention in the State. And uh, it's not power and market, which is often on the end of Man, Economy, and State in some of the newer editions. It's the end of Man, Economy, and State proper. So uh, you might find then that final section would be very helpful where, where Mar Rothbard uh, really creates a type typology of intervention and then also has a lot of useful little sections on intervention and what it means and what effects it has. So let's have a look at intervention then. Uh, we live in a world where the prevailing ideology is one of intervention. That is, uh, we have rejected for the most part this idea of uh, total market socialism, but we've also rejected the idea of a totally laissez-faire market. And part of that just comes out of historical development. Uh, and when Mises refers to interventionism, he's often referring to that specifically, this idea of a third way between communism and total free markets. And so historically, of course, there was, there was laissez-faire, there was liberalism, there was this idea of totally free markets, which of course was never really implemented, but uh, was nevertheless popular among many. And uh, then uh, shortly thereafter, Marxism came in and began to claim that what was really necessary was total control of the marketplace. And what happened, though, over time is that people really started to figure out that uh, total control of the market uh, wasn't really quite uh, working out as, as they might have hoped. And even worse for the Marxists was the fact that Marxist predictions weren't coming true. So what we found is that in the 19th century, people were looking around, even people who were sympathetic to Marx were finding that uh, the workers weren't getting worse off as Marxism predicted they would, that they, they were in fact having a rising standard of living throughout the 19th century, that these people who were working in factories weren't becoming poorer, their lives were actually getting better compared to the drudgery that they might have experienced in the late Middle Ages and so on working in an agricultural world. They were having larger families, they could live in larger living spaces, they had access to more leisure time and so on. And so the socialists realized, well, we have to revise this theory, so we'll come up with this idea that uh, okay, we, we don't want total market control, we just want partial market control. And uh, that's uh, what Mises often refers to as interventionism. There's this idea that there's this, uh, this sweet spot somewhere between uh, totally free markets and totally controlled markets. Now, of course, Mises argued that no such thing exists, uh, that uh, really the farther you get away from a totally free market, the worse off you are. So if we imagine then an axis in our minds we're at one end, we have totally free markets, and at the other end, we have completely controlled economies as total state communism. That uh, the idea of the interventionist is that somewhere here in the middle, you can figure out just what that right amount of intervention is, and uh, that'll be a properly managed economy. That'll be a, the, what, what, what Mises calls the, the hampered economy as opposed to the unhampered marketplace. 
And uh, in reality, though, both Mises and Rothbard would tell us that if, if this end is the totally free market, the farther you get from that, the, the less able you are to become wealthier and happier and to have a more uh, efficient and productive economy. So you, you, this American idea, of course, uh, we want moderate stuff. We don't want to be on these extremes, right? Uh, but there is no golden mean uh, in terms of uh, making a choice about what is the most useful type of marketplace between communism and a totally free market. We don't want something in the middle. We want something over on the laissez-faire end because that is what will help us accomplish our goals. The goal, of course, being a higher standard of living, a happier life, a uh, longer life, and just, uh, just generally things being better uh, given the circumstances that we are put in. And uh, so when you read Mises, be aware that uh, he's referring to a, a specific idea that he calls interventionism. And it's that idea of the third way, which is still very popular today. We hear about it all the time. And of course, in, in the realm of public policy, people are always arguing for a new public policy, a new tax, a new regulation. It's not, they're not going to argue for total state control of the economy. They just want this little regulation to set something right that, that wasn't going well in the economy. And if we can just get this one more little tax, if we can just get this one more little regulation, then people will be much happier. In truth, however, for every additional regulation you get, for every additional tax you get, your economy becomes less efficient. Uh, it, it enters into a state of greater disarray, it becomes more chaotic, and then uh, you either have to repeal those interventions or continue enacting more and more regulations, which eventually leads you all the way down to a state of totally controlled economy. And uh, so how do we avoid that then? Well, of course, uh, part of the, the purpose of the Mises Institute is to, to explain why those interventions in the marketplace are bad. And uh, so, so spoiler alert, we think intervention is bad, and we're going to, to explain why in a little bit more detail, while providing a few uh, examples of different types of intervention and how we can distinguish among the different groups. And so in Man Economy of State, Mises really pulls out three different types of intervention. And uh, the three are autistic intervention. This is where the state acts upon a person directly, uh, compelling that person uh, to act in a certain way, but only on that one person. So an example of this would be uh, a prohibition on you uh, from committing murder. So the state says, you cannot murder anyone. Uh, you cannot steal from people. And these are the sorts of things that we might consider to be moderately legitimate in terms of what the state is doing. These are the hardest things. Uh, this is where the real people get really hung up when you talk about stateless societies and so on, is we, we want the state for these autistic prohibitions, the prevention of thievery and so on. But of course, this can include other things as well, uh, such as prohibitions on uh, ingesting certain foods and doing things that just involve your one person. This is not to be confused, by the way, with purchasing certain foods from another party. That's a different type of intervention. So there's autistic intervention, which is just you and the state, and it's just a transaction that's you yourself. The second type is binary, binary intervention. And that is where the state compels a transaction between you and the state. And that would be taxes, uh, for example, where you normally wouldn't have chosen to enter into this relationship with the state, but the state decides that you owe them a certain amount of money every year, a certain percentage of your income every year. And then uh, there is, but, but there are other types of binary intervention as well that don't necessarily involve cash payments. Uh, the state can extract resources from you in other ways as well. This could include mandatory jury service, for example, where you have to give up a week or two uh, of your time in order to serve the state in that capacity. And then, of course, even in an even more draconian fashion is conscription. That is, if you are drafted into the military or some kind of national service, uh, where every day of your life is essentially you have to give all of your, your labor and time to the state in those cases. So your wealth doesn't have to be extracted in terms of dollar amounts. They can just simply take your freedom away and force you to do work for them as well. But those are all binary interventions. It's just you and the state. And then there are triangular interventions. Those are the sorts of things we probably encounter on a daily basis outside of taxes. That is uh, the state prohibiting you from buying or selling things to other people. 
uh, such as, say, what are deemed to be illegal drugs by the state, uh, but also far more subtle things in many cases. You're not allowed to, say, hire a person at a certain wage rate uh, in the case of the minimum wage, or you're not allowed to sell a house that has been constructed in a certain way. Um, perhaps um, there's a partial prohibition on something. There's full prohibition where I'm not allowed to sell you, say, marijuana of any kind in some states, but there might be a partial prohibition such as rationing where you're only allowed to buy so much of a good or service uh, before it becomes illegal, or licensing is another type of, of partial prohibition as well. So you could cut my hair, well, not my hair, but like hair on somebody, and, uh, but only you can only cut hair in that case if you have a license. And so only certain people are allowed to cut hair. And the overall effect of this over time is, of course, to greatly limit people's choices in the marketplace. And it has the cumulative effect of making us all poor because we're out there trying to live our daily lives, making a variety of decisions that maximize our utility. But everywhere we turn, we're not allowed to actually enact what we would prefer to do. And so as explained earlier by Bob and by Lucas in the earlier talks, let's use Bob's example first. I want to, uh, I have an apple. I purchased an apple somewhere, and that was legal, uh, but I decided I didn't feel like eating this apple. I wanted to give the apple to a squirrel. And, uh, but the state says, no, you can't feed the animals. That's, uh, we, we need all the food we can get, so apples are only for human ingestion, plus apples are bad for squirrels, they might decide. And so now, whereas, as explained earlier, what maximized my utility in that case, or uh, what my first preferred usage of the apple was has now been deemed illegal, so I can't do that. I have to go down and use that apple in such a way that I prefer less. And so now I'm less happy than I would have been otherwise. The other case, of course, being Lucas's case with the, the chocolates and giving the chocolate to his wife. His, his most preferred usage of the chocolates is to give it to his wife, but the state has intervened and said, well, uh, men giving chocolate to women really perpetuates the patriarchy and so on. And so we don't really want you doing that. And so no more shall you be allowed for men to give chocolates to women. And so this, of course, then would have an effect on the overall demand of chocolate. Now, you might say, oh, well, big deal, right? We can't give chocolates to people or I can't give an apple to a squirrel. But an important aspect of this is that it permeates outward uh, from this initial prohibition or from this initial regulation. So it's not just me who is being affected by being unable to give chocolates to people. It's everyone who marketed that chocolate, who packaged that chocolate, who sold that chocolate. They're all now taking a hit as well and becoming less happy, all the way outward to the guy in West Africa who, who grows cocoa beans. And so he could be severely impacted then, perhaps lose his entire livelihood then if the demand for chocolate falls enough. So while these are seemingly very micro types of examples that uh, don't affect a lot of people in actuality, every time you uh, intervene to stop what is seemingly a very nothing type of transaction, it can end up having very significant effects as we move outward uh, into the larger economy. So we'll start to use a few examples then here uh, to, get a, to get a better sense of uh, what are these different um, interventions and who do they affect? How much can they in fact be damaging to the economy? And then also that larger point that Mises made, one of Mises' great contributions to this is the fact that when we intervene, uh, because we're preventing people from doing those things that they prefer the most, and they're the only ones who know what they can prefer, another a state agent cannot know ahead of time whether I want to give that apple to a squirrel or eat the apple. They can't know ahead of time what I want to do with that chocolate. They can't know ahead of time if someone's even going to like chocolate. Maybe my wife hates chocolate and I really was buying the chocolate for something else. Uh, these are all things that the state cannot know and the state cannot calculate on its own. Each of those decisions really has to be made by the acting person who is carrying out that decision, who is demonstrating their preference with each action. Without those actions for us to know and to set prices in the marketplace through these private sector actions, we, we cannot simply manage the economy. It's just, it becomes impossible, is Mises' great contribution to this. And then, so once we notice that, we can also extrapolate from that 
and understand that <clears throat> without this ability to uh, calculate and to know what it is that is of most valuable to people, we can't actually accomplish the goals that we wish to achieve by enacting these interventions in the first place. So if our goal, of course, is to make this certain group of people more well off or that certain pe group of people wealthier or happier, uh, what we will find is that we will enact these uh, interventions, but eventually we find that we uh, uh, affect the economy in ways that we could not predict and actually ends up making the economy overall more dysfunctional and people less well off. And so what happens as people enact these interventions and they realize that they're not uh, accomplishing the goal we want them to accomplish, we then come back to them again and again saying, well, we need to revise this. We didn't do enough of that. We didn't regulate the sector enough. We didn't spend enough tax money on this project. And we're left now with more poverty or more unhappy people. So the next step will just simply be another round of intervention. And that's, of course, the, the central point then of Mises' work on why middle of the road policy leads to socialism is because once you start down that road, then you just keep enacting more and more interventions. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that once you have a few interventions, you're automatically gonna end up with total state communism very soon. There are, of course, uh, uh, ways that people can push back against that. You can always start to repeal those rules. People will often only tolerate tax rates at such and such a rate. People will only tolerate so many regulations. Mises himself says in liberalism that the state can only get away with as much as the people will let it get away with, uh, short of revolt and true opposition position, whether democratic or outside a democratic system. And so we're not saying that every intervention is necessarily uh, going to lead to, uh, to communism, but what we are saying is that every intervention will make us a little bit less well off, and at the same time, will lead many people to conclude that uh, the intervention simply wasn't going far enough. And the next thing we know, we have more and more until we find ourselves quite a bit worse off and noticeably more impoverished than we were originally. So let's use some examples then to get a sense of uh, what are some, uh, you know, what are some real world ways that this plays out. Now, uh, I, before uh, this job, uh, I was a, uh, an economist in the housing industry. So uh, I'm going to use some of these uh, these housing sector examples just uh, because I'm more familiar with them. But of course, you can use them in in a variety of sectors, especially healthcare, for example, employment, and so on. Now, there are, uh, Mises or uh, Rothbard identifies uh, under uh, triangular type intervention, and that's where the state is. Uh, regulating your interactions between two non-state actors, so you and another person not from the state. Uh, price controls are a major subsection of that. And uh, so what's an example of price controls? Uh, well, there are maximum price controls and there are minimum price controls. Minimum wage is always a great place to start when we're talking about price controls. It's a, it's a price floor. And uh, we, of course, covered this in numeral ar numerous articles at, uh, at Mises Daily on Mises.org, should you ever wish to look. And uh, people, of course, might come together and an employer wants to hire a person at a certain wage. And of course, even if that person wishes to work for you for $3 an hour in this country, you would not be permitted to hire that person because of the minimum wage laws. They set a certain wage. Now, of course, as a person, as an employer, you're not, you simply cannot afford to hire someone who's significantly below the minimum wage if that's all, all the productivity that they can provide. So I'm someone with no work experience, I'm not very good at working, and I've never held a job before, so I'm only gonna produce about $3 worth of, uh, of, of productive output per hour. But since my employer is required by law to hire me at $14 an hour, or whatever the minimum age, age is now, uh, soon to be $15 an hour, sure, uh, in many jurisdictions, uh, then I'm simply not gonna hire that person. So we see immediately what the outcome of that uh, price control is, is that we have fewer people getting hired due to a price floor being set. 
But we can also see this in other places as well where a price floor is being set. We can see this in housing, for example. In many jurisdictions, you cannot uh, build a house unless it has certain minimum square footage. So we can't build a tiny little one bedroom uh, in many areas anymore. And so that sets, of course, effectively a price floor for that structure because it has to be of a certain size, which means it has to be of a certain cost. Uh, in many cases. Similarly, we might think of laws where buildings are required uh, in some jurisdictions to have uh, a certain amount of its exterior be in the form of brick or masonry because that looks nicer. Uh, it uh, it uh, you know makes it seem like it's a classier neighborhood and so on. May even have some advantages of longevity. But of course, it's very expensive to put bricks on the exterior of a house, and so that essentially ends up setting an effective price floor for those houses as well. And so then, what the consumer is faced with is a housing stock that has higher prices and they're then unable to purchase those homes. And so what we have done effectively is price many people out of the market uh, via this, this housing price floor, uh, while seemingly it was all justified on the grounds that uh, we're gonna make our, uh, our community look better, and this is gonna keep, uh, of course, for you existing homeowners, this is gonna keep prices higher. You know, so forget about anybody who doesn't own a home yet. We're going to set the, the, uh, the, the home prices higher so that all of you voters here in this town who already own homes will like me more as the city councilman. And uh, we'll, we'll just proceed from there. Now, of course, then what happens once we do that, once we raise that, the price of homes? Well, the next thing we hear now is that there's not enough affordable housing. And so then we need to, of course, create subsidized housing or we need some kind of tax breaks um, or some other government intervention uh, to help more people afford homes. Another case, of course, in, um, in how this uh, affects the, uh, the price of housing is let's go now to a case of binary intervention taxation. We all know that renters effectively are taxed more than homeowners through the... Uh, uh, the the, uh, the home loan interest uh, tax deduction that many homeowners get. Now, notice I, I don't I don't phrase this as a a subsidy of any type to the homeowners. The homeowners aren't receiving a subsidy. That's not the intervention in this case. The fact that some homeowners pay less in taxes is not an intervention. What is the intervention is the fact that renters are paying more in taxes in this case. And what is the effect of this then? Well, it drives then renters to want to be homeowners more because it's more economical for them. They're going to pay less in taxes in order to own a home rather than rent. So the, the overall effect of this then is to push more consumers into homeownership rather than renting. This drives up the price of homeownership and drives down the price of rentals so that the people who uh, are landlords who own apartment buildings actually make less money. It punishes them. And meanwhile, people who are selling homes or people who are developing homes make more money. While at the same time, yet again, rising the price, raising the price of some types of housing. And the next thing we know, we're hearing that, uh, that we need some sort of program to provide down payments to people. And we need to help people get into a first-time homebuyer situation and so on. So every little intervention begets another intervention. And it never actually seems to make housing more affordable. It never actually seems to give people what they want uh, because, as, as Mises noted, uh, you cannot predict the ways that uh, those will actually affect individual persons. And we have to then fix each intervention with a new one. Some other examples, of course, uh, with taxation are the ways in which taxation affects us both coming and going. So with taxes, uh, they get us both with the extraction of the tax as well as the spending of the tax. This was something that Rothbard was, was, was very concerned with, is the fact that, that many people who discuss free markets and so on, they focus only on the taxing side of things. Well, they extract money from us and that's bad. Well, certainly that is true. But the economy also can be greatly distorted by the way that the government pays out those tax funds. And uh, again, with uh, the housing example, uh, and we could use uh, Timothy's example about the bailouts, right? Bankruptcies serve a very important entrepreneurial function, but the bailouts functioned to, uh, pr to prevent uh, these certain firms from being bailed out or from going into bankruptcy. And so what happened there? Well, okay, so I'm a taxpayer and I get 
taxes extracted from me, whether in the form of an inflating currency or in terms of the income tax or any other federal taxes that I might pay. So I'm, I'm poorer because of that on the front end. But then the next step when it comes to spending that money on a bailout, I'm, all, I'm made even worse off because now that money's being spent on inefficient firms that uh, bought up a bunch of homes that were, ended up losing value. Uh, these firms were, were run into the ground like Wells Fargo, J.P. Morgan Chase, and so on. And so rather than letting those firms go into bankruptcy, which would have led to uh, a lot of the homes in their portfolios, and of course I'm simplifying, but we allow the bank to go bankrupt. The homes that they own then are auctioned off, and then people are able to buy those homes at lower prices. So had those firms been allowed to go bankrupt, there would have been a lot of homes entering the market. The price of housing would have gone down. We would have also been rid of ourselves of firms like Wells Fargo and J.P. Morgan Chase, uh, which would have disappeared and been, uh, been replaced by more efficient firms. And so we, it's a win-win in that case uh, because that tax money wasn't used to support inefficient firms. It didn't drive up the, the price of homes artificially by preventing them from being auctioned off in the market at lower prices. And also we now have more uh, efficient firms in the marketplace. And that could have been made better, of course, if we hadn't been taxed in the first place. But we can see how once that tax money is acquired by the state, it then progresses to ever increasing levels of distortion in the market, where once again now, we're left with more expensive housing, and yet again, we've got to do something about that. We've got to keep interest rates low. We have to intervene in the market in a variety of ways uh, just so that we can get more people in housing. Where if we had just left the economy alone in that case, we would have found ourselves with a wide array of affordable housing in the marketplace that wouldn't have existed uh, before. And so these are just a, a few examples of the types of ways that uh, states can intervene and how it leads to a, a cry and a political call for more and more intervention. But if we start to look at what might have happened had we not intervened in the first place, we find that a lot of these problems wouldn't have been created at all. In a, in a certain way, we're, we're lucky that we, we have the, the interventionist point of view. I mean, the alternative was total state communism. So we, we gained a little victory by getting people to admit that private ownership has its advantages. But uh, we certainly have a long way to go, however, in terms of really illustrating that even these little interventions can lead up to big, big problems for people in terms of being able to uh, uh, have a living wage, uh, which, of course, we're told the market should, the, the government should set but really, that can be achieved much more easily by allowing goods in the marketplace uh, to fall in price and which uh, would uh, reflect much more the desires of people in free exchange situations than what we get now. And uh, so I do recommend then for more on this, the final section of Man, Economy, and State by, uh, by Rothbard, in which he will really provide a lot of helpful information, understanding the different kinds of interventions, and then a bit-by-bit bit brief examination of each type, like we've done a little bit here, but uh, there's quite a bit more that uh, I think you'll find useful there. So thank you very much.